Welcome everybody. We've got two really super cool guests today with us from FSU Biology, with Carly and Miles. They're going to be talking to us today for about 20 minutes each. You can ask questions during, have some time for questions afterwards. We got amazing presentations, super cool graphics, great information that ties into what we're learning now and to what we're learning next with ecology and also connect us back a little bit to evolution at the beginning of the year. And Carly is in her third year as a PhD candidate, biological science at FSU, the lab of Emily Lemon, who's faculty in both ecology and evolution at FSU's program in neuroscience. She researches speciation in local tree frogs and studies the neural mechanisms that drive evolution. Before coming to FSU, she got her bachelor's degree in environmental science at University of Texas at Austin and worked as a wildlife rehabilitator in Key Largo. Miles studies different patterns that occur between hosts and parasites, uses mathematics to model these systems and identify trends in how parasites or parasitic disease spreads. He works in Mike Cortez's lab at FSU. Before that, he was, a Utah, he was at Utah State University where he earned degrees in math, biology, and computer science. Let's give him a warm welcome, y'all. Awesome. Thank you. Um, and actually, I think this time, possibly to save time, I think I'm going to save like five minutes at the end for questions, okay. if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> so save your questions. I promise I will give you time at the end. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carly. I'm in the biology department at FSU. I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about my research in brains, behavior, evolution, and frogs. So I'm just going to jump right into it. Um, a big focus in my lab is this idea of speciation. Is the clicker working now? <laughs> Before I get too into talking about speciation, since you guys have talked about evolution a little bit, does this word even sound familiar to anyone? Yes? Yes, okay, so we've all at least heard this once. So you should know that in a sentence, speciation is simply the process by which new species are formed. So in a very simple sense, speciation is when we have an original population and something happens, in this case, it's a geographic barrier that leads to them evolving reproductive isolation, which means they can no longer interbreed with one another. Therefore, they are different species. And so my lab really focuses on this step in speciation, this evolution of reproductive isolation. So reproductive isolation is really important for one way that we can define species, and that is the biological species concept, which states that a species is a group of organisms that can interbreed to create viable and fertile offspring, meaning that their offspring both survive and can produce offspring of their own. And so we talk about reproductive isolating barriers as things that prevent that from happening. And so there are two different broad types of barriers. There's prezygotic and postzygotic. Prezygotic barriers are mechanisms that prevent egg and sperm from meeting. They prevent fertilization from occurring to generate an embryo. Whereas postzygotic barriers are mechanisms that do allow an embryo to form. However, they do prevent that embryo from developing into a viable fertile offspring. So a broad question here in evolution is like, why is reproductive isolation even important? I'm gonna demonstrate this with a little example. So let's imagine that we have two butterflies. They're the same species. They mate over time, they have offspring. And then over more time, those offspring have lots of their own offspring. So this is an example where these original two butterflies have high evolutionary fitness. So in science, we talk about fitness not as being like how much you work out, how much you can bench press, but just how many offspring you have and what is the quality of your offspring. So can they produce many offspring of their own? So in this case, this would be high evolutionary fitness. However, let's say that the same butterfly mates with a different butterfly that uh, might be a different species. They also produce offspring, but it's less offspring. And then that offspring produces even less of its own offspring. So this would be a decrease in evolutionary fitness due to choosing the wrong mate. And when this happens, we can see the evolution of reproductive isolation when there's selection against choosing the wrong mate. And so a big question here is, how do species stay reproductively isolated from one another? Scientists have found that there's a lot of different ways that species can stay reproductively isolated from one another. 
Uh, here I'm just going to briefly run through like five of the big ones. Um, these are only pre-zygotic. However, if you have questions about post-zygotic, I will be happy to answer them. Temporal isolation is where organisms don't interact or breed at the same time as each other, so then they don't get the chance to mate with one another. This example is the 13-year and 17-year periodical cicadas, which emerge at different times, so they rarely get to interbreed. This year is the one exception, so it's maybe not a great example for this year, uh, because it only happens every 221 years that they emerge together, and it just so happens to be 2024. Another example is habitat isolation, uh, wherein organisms do not occupy the same habitats, therefore they do not interbreed. In this example, these apple maggot flies, one species inhabits apples, so they breed and eat on apple fruits, uh, whereas this other closely related species breeds and eats uh, hawthorn berries. Mechanical isolation is where organisms uh, have reproductive organs that physically cannot uh, come in contact with one another for fertilization to occur. So in this example, these left and right coiling snails, uh, the openings of their shells do not meet up, so therefore they cannot breed with one another. In plants, there's also pollinator isolation, uh, where different species utilize different pollinating animals, therefore they can't cross-pollinate. So this flower on the left is pollinated almost only by bees, whereas the flower on the right is pollinated mostly by hummingbirds, therefore they don't cross-pollinate one another. And lastly, and this one is near and dear to my heart since it is the focus of my research, behavioral isolation is where organisms utilize unique mating displays and behaviors and rituals uh, to communicate their species identity, and that is how uh, typically females select mates. So these birds of paradise are closely related, yet obviously they have very elaborate and unique uh, mating plumage and mating dances that are unique to their species and are only attractive to those females of the same species. And so this is one way that organisms can communicate their species identity, right? So these birds are using sort of visual cues and also some auditory cues. There are lots of different sensory modalities by which organisms can communicate their species identity. Um, like I said, visual and auditory, but there's also tactile cues, so touch, gustatory, which is taste, olfactory is our sense of smell, and even some signals that we can't really detect, like electrical signals and also visual cues that use light outside the range of our own visual sensitivity. Uh, however, I'm going to be focusing on acoustic signals and auditory processing, since there are a lot of animals that differentiate conspecifics, which are individuals of the same species, from heterospecifics, which are individuals of a different species, through sound. So these will be things like birds, insects, frogs, the topic of my presentation today, are all going to be mostly using sound to communicate what species they are. So if animals are using specific sounds to communicate their species identity, then how do the animals hearing those sounds that are receiving those acoustic signals, how do they recognize them as being from same species individual or different species individual? So to address this question, I use a local frog, the upland chorus frog. Its Latin name is Sudacris feriarum, to sort of get at this question from a couple of different angles. So the upland chorus frog is unique in its breeding. They actually breed in the wintertime, unlike a lot of other frogs, so roughly from December to February. And they utilize a strategy that's called explosive breeding. That is the actual scientific word for it, is explosive breeding. And that means that under the right conditions, under the right temperature and precipitation, lots and lots and lots of frogs will gather at the same place on the same night, breed over one or two nights, and then they're done for the whole rest of the year. So that's our explosive breeding cycle. And at these very large breeding aggregations, males will call to attract females. So they take a big breath in, and then they just shuttle air between their lungs and their vocal sac on their neck um, to make their larynx vibrate, and that produces calls. So again, males will call to attract females, and I'm going to show you guys a video of a male upland chorus frog calling at a breeding aggregation out here in Apalachicola National Forest. So you can see this main guy here. You can also hear lots and lots of other frogs calling in the background. Again, they're big, noisy aggregations. So I'm showing you a map here of the eastern U.S., and this dark gray blob here is the range of the upland chorus frog, the frog that I just showed you a video of. This lighter gray blob down here, more towards the south, is a different but closely related species of frog called the southern chorus frog. And as you can see, there are a couple different areas where the two species overlap, and that overlap leads to some pretty cool evolutionary outcomes. So up here in the northern part of the range, the upland chorus frog, just hanging out on its own, 
I'm gonna play you guys a sample of what its call sounds like from these areas, right? Very similar to what we just heard. Whereas down here, for example, uh, farther south in Florida, the southern chorus frog, it has a similar but also slightly different call. And I want you guys to listen for the difference. So this is the southern chorus frog. And then this is the upland chorus frog. Back to the southern chorus frog. You guys hear the difference? Yes? What's the difference? A little bit the speed. The pitch a little bit. Yeah, definitely the speed. So one way that we can visualize frog calls is on this graph called an oscillogram, where we have time on the x-axis and sound energy on the y-axis. And if we look at the call, we can see that it's just a really fast train of sound pulses. And this is for this guy, the upland chorus frog. And if we plot the same oscillogram for the southern chorus frog, we do see something like this, where it is also just a series of sound pulses. However, those sound pulses are a lot slower, so it's a slower pulse rate, and therefore there's also fewer pulses per call. And so down here, like in Apalachicola National Forest, where the two species overlap, we do see some really cool outcomes because uh, the upland chorus frog and the southern chorus frog will breed at the same place at the same time. And so sometimes they do interact with one another. And even uh, female upland chorus frogs will mate with southern chorus frogs. And when this happens, they produce these hybrid frogs, which we have found through experiments. These frogs really don't do that well in the wild. The hybrids don't do that well. They survive okay through metamorphosis, but once they reach adulthood, they don't really breed that much. They have really weird mating calls that are like completely unsexy to any other frog. So therefore they have really low evolutionary fitness. And this is really similar to the butterfly example that I was showing you guys, right? Where choosing the wrong mate can decrease your fitness. And so because this is happening, we do see that the upland chorus frog has evolved really different mating calls in areas where they coexist with the southern chorus frog. So again, this is our call for our normal upland chorus frog. This is the call for the southern chorus frog. And in areas where they overlap, for example, down here in ANF, their new different calls sound something like this, right? So I'm gonna play you the normal one again. And this is a different one. So kind of different, right? Like you can definitely hear it. And if we plot it on an oscillogram, you can see that there is a really great increase in pulse rate and also the number of pulses. So we can ask this question of like, okay, so these chorus frogs have different calls from these chorus frogs. Um, so does that mean that females will still recognize conspecific males from other populations as suitable mates? Like, will females from here that are used to hearing this call, will they still be attracted to males that produce this call? So we can do experiments to address this question. And in fact, we do find that there is some level of reproductive isolation between upland chorus frogs from different populations. So these females don't really think these males are that sexy, even though we're calling them the same species. And so since they are at least partially isolated, we asked, are they different species? And by looking at their DNA, I found that they aren't quite species yet, but we think that they are slowly becoming different species. So currently we are living at like this snapshot of a very early stage in speciation, which is what makes these frogs really cool to study. So I promised you guys brains, behavior, evolution, and frogs. So far I've talked about behavior, evolution, and frogs. So you're like, where are the brains, right? That's the whole reason why you're here, I'm sure, the brains. <laughs> So I'm gonna talk about two research questions that sort of address this neuroscience aspect to my research. So the first question will be sort of like, what goes on in the brains of chorus frogs when they hear same species mating calls versus different species mating calls? And then I'll talk a little bit about why chorus frogs prefer different calls over others, like what in their brain drives them to prefer some calls over others. So to address this first question, I use a lab technique called immunohistochemistry to see where patterns of neural activity occur in frog brains after they hear sounds. So to do this, I will literally take a frog, play it a sound, a call over a speaker, and then we can take a little cross section of its brain. So this is a cross section of a brain that I stained with like a purple dye. So each purple dot is one individual cell. 
And then I can apply these cool molecules that will glow under a certain light condition to see where neural activity occurs. So then under a special microscope, we can see each little tiny green dot here being a cell that is active when it's hearing uh, a call. And then we can compare that to a different frog that heard a different call and see that there's not really that much activity, right? There's only like a couple cells that are active up there. And so then I can compare these patterns of neural activity between frogs that hear same species calls and different species calls. And we do find that there are some differences there, which is really cool, but only in certain brain regions. Uh, I love this image because there's just so much activity going on in it, right? So each individual cell that's glowing was active when the frog was hearing the sound. Um, just really cool. Lots and lots of activity going on there. As for the second question, why do some chorus frogs prefer different calls over others? I use a really different technique. I actually do behavior experiments, but first I want to do a bit of a primer. You guys know neurons, right? We are familiar, yes? So frogs have special neurons in their brain that can count sounds. <laughs> so if you recall, a neuron receives a chemical signal at one end from another cell, transmits that by an electrical impulse that we call an action potential, and then releases another chemical signal at the other end for another cell to pick up. And so we can actually use a cool technique that sort of listens in on the electrical pulses in neurons in a live animal. And this is called electrophysiology. And to do this, we use a really, really tiny glass recording electrode to listen in to the activity of one individual neuron in the brain of a frog. And so we can play it a uh, sound from a speaker, like a frog call, and then we can look at the electrical response in that neuron by picking up on those action potentials. And so for these special counting neurons that frogs have, if we were to play it this sound, right, so it's a series of pulses, then we might pick up electrical activity that looks something like this, where there's no electrical activity, and then at some threshold, there is activity. And so this neuron only starts firing after eight sound pulses. And what we find is that the number of pulses to elicit firing varies among frog species and also among populations within a species. So my research is sort of focusing on like, what do counting neurons even do? And we have measurements from neurons that show that different chorus frog populations have neurons that respond to sounds differently, right? Those counting neurons. And so I'm interested in what are the behavioral consequences of those neural tuning differences? And so I asked, does the behavior of counting neurons match the behavior of female frogs when they choose mates? And to do this, I use a behavioral technique called phonotaxis assays. Phonotaxis just means movement towards or away from sound. And this type of experiment mimics what happens in nature when females are listening to males calling and then they will approach a male that they think is sexy so they can mate. And so again, I asked this question. There's a couple of things I need to do first. First, I need to capture amplex pairs of chorus frogs from breeding aggregations across the Southeast US. Uh, this is an amplex pair the male is clasping onto the female when they mate. And then I will drive them all the way back to Tallahassee and this is a video I took driving down Tennessee Street in my car with like a bag of a hundred something frogs and then they're very loud. They don't go quietly at all. Very lucky I did not get pulled over. Um, <laughs> and then lastly, I could perform these phonotaxis assays on females to test their preferences for specific calls. And so when I'm doing the experiment, it looks something like this, right? So the frog is just in a kiddie pool with speakers on either end, and each speaker is playing a different call and it's alternating. So the female will start here in the center, then once we're ready to start, she can be free to move around. So the video I'm gonna show you is after several minutes, the female has swam around a bunch of times, sampled both speakers a couple of times, and the female is right here, and she is just about to make a choice for the left speaker. And we, the researchers, are watching the cameras, gripping the table really hard, so excited. Yes, she makes a choice. <laughs> yeah, good frog. <laughs> oh, it's just playing again. So when she makes a choice, it's very clear that she's making a mate choice, right? Um, they are choosing one speaker or the other. And in, from these experiments, I have found that, you know, to answer this question, does the behavior of counting neurons match the behavior of female frogs when they choose mates? Sometimes they do. 
The upland chorus frogs that do coexist with the southern chorus frogs do seem to be using those counting neurons to choose their mates. However, the chorus frogs that live far from that other species do not really seem to be using those counting neurons to choose their mates, which is really interesting. And this is an open research question that I plan to address throughout the rest of my PhD. So to briefly summarize, this was the title of my talk, um, also known as all the reasons why I love my research. I love getting to integrate these lab techniques, uh, as well as doing these really awesome behavior experiments and getting to interact with animals on the daily basis. This is a newly metamorphosed chorus frog, so, so, so small. We have like literally 500 something of them over at, on campus right now. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> Um, and lastly, I do want to remind you that although I'm a scientist, I'm also a normal person. I know that when I was in your position, I very much like put researchers on a pedestal. Um, however, I want to remind you all that I am also just a person. Um, I did not always think that I was going to be a scientist. I thought that maybe I was going to be an artist or a dive master. Um, so my path to get here has not at all been linear. And I want to remind you all that you can have your own interests and no matter where you are, the path to being a biologist is open to you. That being said, if you have any questions or inquiries about getting involved in research, maybe you'll go to college in a year or two. Um, any advice on getting into research, I am definitely here for you. That's my email. Okay, that's it. I think we have like a couple minutes for questions. Yeah. So um, at what point do you, do you guys decide that it's become a different species? You know how you were saying that there was like... Um, it wasn't you researched it and you thought it wasn't there yet, but that it could be. How do you decide? That's a big question that people love to argue about so much. Um, <laughs> so typically now we need lots and lots of different lines of evidence to say that things are different species. So typically we'll look at their behaviors, especially we'll look at their DNA to see if their DNA is different enough to call them different species. Um, Typically, we need like lots of evidence to show that. And for this example, there is some behavioral evidence that they're becoming different species. However, the DNA doesn't quite show it yet. Are you doing the DNA analysis in your lab or is that outsourced? Or? I have already done it. It is published in Ecology and Evolution. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I was wondering how you look at the frogs' brains. Like, obviously, they're too small to, like, scan. How we look at what? Like, their brains. Like, how you do, like, a cross-section. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I dissect them, and then I use a special machine. Well, I'll dissect them and then freeze them so they're really cold, like negative 80 degrees Celsius. And then once they're really cold, I can cut them on a special machine that lets them stay really cold. And it uses a really, really fine blade so that I can cut very, very, very thin sections of brain tissue in sort of that plane. Does that make sense? Yeah. I was gonna ask, um, like what kind of initiates when this frog breeding season starts? Because there's like the month spans that it could happen, but if it only lasts two days, what kind of triggers that event? Yeah, so again, we don't know for 100%, which is kind of insane. <laughs> Um, we do know that they like a certain temperature range. So historically, they tend to breed when it's like nighttime temperatures around 50 degrees, daytime temperature around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And then there needs to be a lot of rain. So if it's a lot of rain during the day, at least two inches during the day, and then um, around those temperature range, you can bet that there might be a breeding aggregation that night. But it is somewhat of a guessing game. Okay. So that's a good question. <laughs> Where that hasn't happened, like you haven't had um, the right circumstances, and did they just not breed that year? So it has happened at least once since I've been at FSU, to my knowledge. Um, it is quite rare though, because we don't know if they bred and we just weren't there for it, or if they actually just didn't breed that year. So it's kind of hard for us, like as humans, to tell. Um, but it has happened, I believe, once about maybe four or five years ago, that one population didn't breed just because it was a drought um, and there wasn't enough water. There wasn't a pond for them to breed in, yeah. So there's like, there's kind of, they have a very wide range. So do some of them start breeding at different times and like how widespread is it when like one group starts breeding? 
Yeah, so they, that's a good observation. They are very widespread, and mostly the populations do breed at somewhat different times, but still within that December to February range. Okay. Um, typically, if there's a big storm front, so they tend to move west to east across the U.S., so when there's like a big storm, you know, that stretches all the way from like North Carolina down here to Florida, and it's moving west to east, that has happened in happened the 2022 field season that there was a giant storm that moved all the way across and then all the populations bred at once from South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, North Georgia, South Georgia, Florida, Alabama, a little bit in Louisiana. They all bred at once and it was insane. <laughs> but typically they do breed at slightly different times depending on local weather conditions. Nice. Well, I'm going to switch this out, but I have one question in terms of kind of in the lab versus in the field work. Do you ever bring the microphones out and collect audio samples out in the field? Or how does it differ when you're in the field versus in the lab? So before I came to FSU, most of our mail recordings were done in the field. Um, we have special field microphones that we'll take out with us. Um, so we did that for a really long time. One of my lab mates who recently graduated, um, Dr. Masia Dai, did, all, did a lot of her dissertation using those field recordings from males. Mm -hmm. um, however, those recordings are hard to deal with on the computer because there's a lot of background noise to cut out of those recordings. So what we have developed in the last three years is a system. Um, it's just literally like an in sound insulated box that we can put an individual male in and then provoke him to call using recordings that we play back at him to provoke him to get angry enough to start calling. And then um, that way we can get a nice clear recording in this sound insulated chamber with no background noise. Yeah. <laughs> Hey everybody, I'm Miles. So um, what Carly does is incredibly important to ecology, which is just um, very generally speaking, the study of interactions between organisms. And so she, what she does is a little different than what I do. Um, she goes outside and goes and looks at real life organisms and measures things about them and asks questions about them. So that's what's called an empirical ecologist, meaning someone who's based off of data and reality. Now, on the other hand, I um, play pretend all day. I am what's called a theoretical ecologist. And what that means is I use mathematical models, computer simulations, and just basically broad ideas about systems like, uh, like chorus frogs. Um, I don't work on that specifically, but um, things like that to try to make big claims across species. So for example, um, you could make a model about how frequently these frogs mate and talk about how quickly you expect the population to grow. Um, now that's just predictions, right? So um, the, the best things that models are used for are first of all to just trying to see if our theory about things are right. So is it correct to say that, you know, for example, with Carly's research, if it rains this much on this day and this much occurs uh, and this much, um, what was the other besides precipitation? Temperature, Temperature of course. Um, uh, if it's this warm this day, I expect this many frogs to show up. And so this is a way to test our ideas. Is it accurate to say that this will cause this kind of things? So that's what models can help with on one side of things. Another thing is sometimes we're interested in the specific rates or the specific numbers of things. So what I do is I study parasitic diseases specifically. And so I might be interested on in how quickly does do things spread. And the thing is, you have like a rough estimate, like COVID, we would all say spread fast. And other things like Ebola spread um, so fast that it burned out. This is almost the opposite. Um, in some ways. So um, besides looking at just testing our real theories to see if it matches reality, we're also sometimes interested in measuring and making measurements about things through models to try to guess for one person who's sick, how many people are they going to get sick, kind of things like that. Then finally, we might be interested in asking how long is this going to last as far as a disease go, goes. Like, for example, all the models that we have seem to suggest that COVID is unfortunately around to stay. It's going to be like a new seasonal disease, which is very unfortunate. I was not a fan, um, but it's still with us today. So um, 
those are kind of the, the big three reasons why you might want to model epidemics um, and, and just systems in biology in general. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is, first of all, I'm going to talk about how do you collect disease data in the first place. So how do you measure how this stuff spreads through populations? How can you tell how many people were sick? Then we're going to talk about how um, different models are available to us to talk about the spread of disease and how different ones are better for different situations. Then we're going to talk about how to analyze them. How do we actually get answers from these things? What's the point of making a model without analysis? There is no point, um, is the idea. So uh, we'll talk about those three things. So to start with, we'll talk about collecting disease data itself. So first of all, you can have what's called infection tracing. And what we have here are I's and S's, I meaning infected and S meaning susceptible, AKA not infected. So um, for a given disease, a person might be able to say, we, we know this person and this person um, are sick. We can ask them, who did you get sick from? And sometimes they, that, those two people will have an answer. They'll say this person. Who did you get sick from? We'll ask this person. We go up the chain, up the chain to try to find out where it started and how it spread. Now, this is not always possible. I got sick a couple weeks ago. I still have no clue where I got it from. I'm still upset about it. I'm very bitter. So, um, but regardless, um, what's this? What's that? Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm through with that person once I find out who got me sick. So um, the alternative besides infection tracing is also contact tracing. So instead of just focus on who's infected, you can talk about who contacted who. And that is an even bigger set of data than this one because this is just looking at infected individuals. This is asking infected individuals, who did they contact? And that can give new information where possible to collect this data. So for example, you could see, okay, this person contacted 20 people and only five of them got sick. So there's like maybe you could say 25% chance that the disease will transmit from one person to another. So that gives different information where possible to collect. And then finally, um, you can do what's called diary-based studies where you're basically asking people to go back to their own records to see when they got sick. And this is not very reliable data, but sometimes it's all you have. So um, with that data in hand, you it's good to be able to pick a direction to go with modeling. Now, a model in general is just um, like a play toy. These three things you could say are models. Um, this is a rhino of a, a, a model of a rhino, but it is not very realistic. Uh, I don't mean to offend. Um, I've never seen a corner like this on a rhino before. Um, maybe if I'm, yeah, I don't know what. Uh, but, but there's plenty of stuff that's very helpful about it. It's recognizable as a rhino. It has a lot of like the same limbs as a rhino. All of them, in fact. And um, the idea with a model is that it's supposed to be like a play toy. You try to make something that matches some aspects of a system you're interested in and then ask questions about it. Does that make sense? So I'm going to talk about two different ways that you can do that. So the first one, um, actually, first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, three different ways that we might choose to model um, diseases. And usually diseases fall into one of three camps on, um, on how they're spread. So first of all is direct transmission. So we have two pigs here. Um, they might come in contact with each other and transmit a virus from one person, one individual to another. So that's just direct transmission. I think we're pretty used to talking about this, especially with COVID, because after a lot of studying, um, scientists found out that COVID was most strongly transmitted just from you know coughing on people or um, direct contact. Now there are alternatives, which we'll talk about for a second uh, in a second. But I'll just mention real quick that it doesn't even need to be within the same species. I don't know if y'all heard that um, like there were some other mammals that got sick from COVID as well. Like I think meeks was one of them, and maybe even house cats, I think. So diseases can spread between species as well. Another idea of how disease can spread is that maybe a sick individual contributes back a bunch of fungal spores. This is the example I'm using here. So these are water fleas. The idea is that they get sick. These, um, these, this fungi gets into their digestive tract and punch it, punctures their belly and just starts growing inside of them. It's a nasty looking thing, but also these guys don't have a brain. 
So I don't really feel that bad for them. So um, they will end up dying and spitting out all of their spores that were growing inside of them. And that's how this disease spreads. The, the distinction here is here, two living organisms contact each other. Whereas here, once this dies, it contributes these spores to the environment. And you have another individual who comes and eats them. Because these things, referring back to the lack of brain, can't tell a difference between what is a fungal spore and what is food. So I think we all have a leg up on them in that sense. So they are consuming these fungal spores and becoming um, sick themselves by the stuff that's getting contributed to the environment. So stuff like this, um, as far as in humans, um, are a little bit more uh, gross. Uh, like things like um, MRSA, which is a bacterial infection that sometimes you'll hear about an outbreak happening in like a wrestling team or something because they didn't sanitize the mats well. So that would be like a wrestler who has a, a rash, is, you know, wrestling as they do, and then get some uh, bacteria on the mat and then someone else comes and touches it. It's different because that person wouldn't have to even see a person to get sick. They just have to interact with the environment. A little different that way. Then finally, the last class is vector transmission, which is something that doesn't actually get sick by the disease, but does carry the disease. I think the one, the example we're most familiar with is um, stuff like through um, how mosquitoes can make you sick. With malaria, um, that's a big example, or also Zika, or um, ticks carry around Lyme disease. The difference is that that vector, that mosquito, or or tick, or whatever you're talking about, they're not getting sick themselves. They're not affected by the disease. So they'll just keep going, keep biting their hosts, and spreading that disease. So it's a little different that way. So these three different ways can have hugely different outcomes on what it looks like in the real world for how these diseases are spreading. I'm, I usually focus on direct transmission because it is the easiest to use for modeling in a lot of cases. And when you can make your model simpler, it's usually better, if that's allowable. So there's a couple different ways that these uh, that uh, uh, events that occur. So you can see in this animation um, with a disease, two individuals come in contact with each other. One makes the other sick. So it goes from infected or uh, susceptible to infected. So this is a transmission event. So that's one thing that's going to happen. You're go you're going to get sick. Another event that's going to happen is that you'll you were sick at one point, but then recovered. And that R stands for both recovered and resistant, meaning that for the next little while, you're not going to get that sickness again. Then finally, there's going to be a point in time where sometimes for some diseases, you lose that resistance. I think people are familiar with that with COVID. I'm sure some of you got COVID a couple times and were very bummed about it. So um, at some point in time, you lose resistance and become susceptible again and can become infected once more. So those are the three big. Um, transitions between states that um, I'm interested in in the model that I'm going to show you today. So being a uh, transmission, so becoming infected, becoming recovered, or becoming susceptible again. So um, sometimes, uh, depending on how interactions are occurring in the species, you'll want to use different models. Say, for example, um, what's your, your name over here in blue shirt? Gabrielle. So say Gabrielle um, talks to 10 random people a day, people that usually you've never met. So if you were to pick 10 random people out of Tallahassee Day and, and interact with them, first of all, that sounds very stressful um, and, and socially strenuous. However, um, that would be what's called random mixing, meaning that if you and everyone else was do were doing that same thing, that means that everyone's contacting everybody. There's not really a real trend. Um, and so that's one option. Another option is that um, let's pick over here the plaid. What's your name? Amari. So Amari, um, for example, she has a set of friends that she talks to every day, and those friends she'll have repeat contacts with. It's not going to be a random person every time. Um, so depending on different assumptions, you want to use different models. And the truth is, no model is perfect. You'll see errors in the model that I present, as in things that break away from reality, but it's still helpful is the point in answering some questions. So one, when things are random mixing, we often use ODE models, which is um, differential equations. 
Um, anybody like calculus in here? I got one hand raised last time. Uh, half, I'll count you down as a half. Is that all right? All right. So uh, did you get a half hand raised? That makes one interested person in total. So the idea here is, I'm sure you're familiar with the derivative from your classes. The idea is we're trying to see how quickly is the number of susceptible people changing and the number of infected people changing, the number of resistant people changing. So we relate that derivative in time to events that are occurring. And I'll talk about that more in a second. But then alternatively, we're also, we can also use networks to talk about people who have sustained connections with individuals. And then am I right that I have about, is that uh, about seven minutes left-ish? Yeah. More questions? Okay. So here's what some of those um, equations look like. I'm going to skip over these because I want to focus mostly on the second one. But um, this is kind of what those equations look like. This equation is literally just saying the number of susceptible individuals is changing because people are having babies. Um, people are becoming infected. And people are dying. So that is, you can imagine that you can, for each of these classes, you can just talk about how could someone become susceptible or stop being susceptible. And you just include those things in these equations and then hit play on the computer and just see what happens, more or less. Um, or use math techniques to analyze that. So that's one option. And I usually do these. But I'm also a really big fan of network models, which um, take the idea of um, sustained connections with people. So... Um, mechanistic rates are what we talked about before, infection, recovery, as in um, becoming resistant, and then loss of resistance. Those are the three big things that we're interested in here. The state changes, you might say. You're changing from a state of being infected to not infected. So, um, is it Ariel? No. Amari, I'm sorry. Amari is sitting right here. Let's say that we have Amari sitting right here. Is that M A uh, A M A R I? Okay, A A M A R I, right? Okay, and then right in front of Mari is Eli, E L, and then I'm gonna put both I and Y. How's that? You get both. Um, and then to the left, Miranda. Okay, so um, I can see over here. And you want to help me out? M M I R. Okay. I can do the rest, I bet. Okay, so we got these three people that are kind of connected with each other. Let's say that Amari, unfortunately, regretfully, is sick with something that is directly transmitted. So what we could say is that in one time step, meaning like maybe like one day in class, there is some fixed probability that Amari will infect Eli with an I and Y, or alternatively, Miranda. All right, so let's say there's like a 50% probability for each of those. So what, oops, I guess I lost that part with you. Okay, there's a 50% probability for both of those. So basically for a given day, we flip a coin and see, does Eli get sick or does Miranda get sick? And then we can also ask the question that with some probability, what is the, the chance that Amari stops being sick and becomes resistant? And then you can do that over and over again. And for time, I'm going to skip over this. This is just a little side comment. So as far as analyzing models go, I'm going to um, show you some animations that will show how um, different values of these rates that we're interested in can have big impacts on how the disease turns out. So you can see here, across all of these, they have the same infection rate, as in that coin flip between Amari and Eli, and between Amari and Miranda, um, is 20% chance instead of 50% chance. And then recovery rate, the chance that Amari will become recovered and resistant is a 10% chance every day. So that's the same for all of these. Red means infected, purple means recovered and resistant, and then blue means susceptible. And so you can see here, there's some trends here. I'm curious to hear what you guys see as we have the increasing loss, increasing rate of resistance loss. Here, once you get it and you uh, recover, you're never going to get it again. Here, 10%, uh, there's a 10% chance every day that you lose resistance. 
What kind of trends do you guys see here? Yeah. Kind of lingers further and further as the resistance loss rate increases. And yeah. It stays in the population. Level. Okay, so the disease lingers. Is that what you're thinking? Okay, cool. So, um, it, yeah, definitely. Any other comments? Yeah. It's like, more, it's like almost having waves. Like yeah, there's something interesting. Like, there's something different about this one than the other guys. Mm -hmm. um, th these guys, it seems like it burns through really quickly, like a forest fire. Um, it goes out, and then there's nothing. These people aren't becoming susceptible fast enough for any kind of reinfection to occur. But yeah, there, it seems like waves are happening here. And that's an interesting part of that is enlightening about this model, is that there's like an optimum point between... 0.1% and 10%, something in between where you end up seeing waves of outbreaks. Anything else? Um, so you know how like one strain of like a cold or something will pass through a school? Do you think that's because everyone's become resistant to that strain? Like, is that why it stops, I guess? Why the strain doesn't come around again later? Is that the idea? Yeah, like how like, I guess at schools, like the cold's always like different every year, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, definitely. Uh, there's um, usually cases of people who get an old strain if they're still susceptible to it, but it's pretty rare. And then it's not able to spread well because most people are resistant to it. Um, but you're thinking about the right things because um, in these simulations, we're assuming that there's just one infectious disease going around and that it's no different from any other individuals that are sick. So that was a good question. Anything else on this? Okay, last thing I'll, I'll mention is that this is the lattice network, which is um, like, I'll, I'll pull up this picture one more time, where um, we have everyone, uh, for each person, they have a neighbor front, back, left, and right. So, um, and that's just a grid. And that means every single person in our model is assumed to have exactly one or four contacts with people. Now, here's an alternative where basically you break up that huge grid into little neighborhoods, little groups of nine. So the black here is like the barriers between neighborhoods. And then this is about the spread of the disease through neighborhoods. And we see a very different outcome, even though every number is the same here from the previous slide. What differences are you guys seeing? So people just stop spreading. Yeah, definitely. It seems that this gets about to three neighborhoods. I can see it a little closer here. So three neighborhoods until it burns out. Here it's about eight. And then here it doesn't seem to ever completely stop. Other things? A lot of people are recovering. Uh, yeah. Yeah, which which one are you t talking about when you're Like, that? isn't the purple means it's recovered? Yes, so like in that's any correct. any of them, you, they really don't recover that well. I can't use a lot of purple. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't pick great colors for standing up, but yes, you're right. That um, yes, uh, people they recover and then stay recovered, and that causes disease burnout quickly. Um, and then I think what you're talking about is just that it doesn't end up spreading that much here. Is that correct? Is that what? You're yeah. Well, over? even in the point one, like uh huh, it just kind of the the red kind of increases. You don't see a ton of people like recovering. Sure, I see what you're saying. Yeah, because they lose recovering, or they re lose resistance so quickly. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for explaining that. So one big difference I'll point out here is that, well, I'll ask you, what's the big difference about the motion of this disease between this one and this one? One's kind of going in one direction, the other is spreading all of that. Yeah, definitely. There seems like this is just kind of doing a slow crawl throughout, and sometimes it seems to have little branches off and breaks off, and but it's mostly going in one direction. But just like you said, this is having radial spread, meaning just spreading equal amounts in all directions, more or less. So the I just hope that I've uh, introduced this idea well enough that you can kind of understand how, although neither of any of the models that I showed you are not perfect at all, no one stays put and has exactly four friends, but uh, he does. He has four friends, is that right? Is that what you're saying? Okay, nice. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought it was uh, um, 19. My bad. I didn't know you had that many. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.